Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 18 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week it's my monthly Q&A and this one is for June. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. So welcome once again to my weekly podcast, and my thanks to those of you listening via the Patreon page. I really do appreciate your support. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a support page where you can help me create more content by signing up to one of my reward tiers, and in return you gain access to additional content and support from me. These start from as little as $1 per month, so I believe with the regular quality content I'm producing, $1 represents excellent value for money. If you've not yet started beekeeping and you're looking for help and assistance, pop over to my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk forward slash get started, and I'll do all I can to help out with suggestions and recommendations for you. As usual, I'll leave any relevant links to things that we talk about in the podcast in this week's show notes. If you've listened to some of the previous podcasts, you'll be familiar now with our monthly Q&A sessions. This is where you can send in questions relating to your beekeeping or just general beekeeping topics, and I'll do my very best to give you an answer that will help you on your way through the season. The best way to send in questions is via my Patreon page, although you can also go to the YouTube channel. You can also catch up with me on my website, Facebook, and also all of the other social media avenues such as Twitter and Instagram. First up, we've got a couple of questions from Greg Palmer. Thanks for these, Greg. Uh, First question from Greg is, Hi Stuart, I've just hived my second swarm and quarantined it in an out apiary. Additionally, I've just performed the two nukes from one parent colony manipulation following the printout that you provided. My question is, when should I be adding these details to the NBU website, please? Are nukes counted as hives once the queen has mated, or should I register now, especially as AFB, that's American Fowl Brood, has been notified locally, and I await a visit from the regional bee inspector? My observations tell me I am clear. Thanks, Greg. So for those of you not familiar with the MBU, those initials stand for the National Bee Unit, and they're a government body that's been involved in, I guess, the management and control of bee pests and diseases. They also carry out lots of training and uh, pass on lots of information to beekeepers generally across England and Wales here in the UK. And they have a team of bee inspectors who carry out field inspections on beekeepers' colonies to ensure that they are fit and well. And one of the things that you can benefit from is if you register with the National Bee Unit, they will send out email notifications to alert you to the fact that there may be one of the statutory notifiable diseases found in your local area. So that's American Fowl Brood and European Fowl Brood. So it's well worth registering with the National Bee Unit and I'll put a link to their website in the show notes. So one of the things that you can do is register your apiaries and the quantity of hives that you've got at that apiary so the location is known to the National Bee Unit so that they can monitor the local area and advise you if there is uh, disease outbreaks in your area and also come around and take a a look at your bees. So Greg, provided you've got your apiary listed with the National Bee Unit, then when the bee inspectors are checking the area, that apiary will come up on their list. It's not quite so important to have the exact numbers that you've got in that apiary, provided the apiary is listed and that they can identify it. Having said that, it's always good to know exactly how many colonies you've got in an apiary and it will help the bee inspector to assign an amount of time in order to spend with you inspecting your bees. So it doesn't matter whether they've got a laying queen or not. If you've got a box with some bees in it, then that's what will be identified by the bee unit as a hive. And so yes, I would add it to your 
records so that they know exactly how many colonies you've got in that apiary. Greg goes on to ask another question. After hiving a swarm on two drawn frames and nine foundation, should I feed syrup immediately to help draw frames? And what about giving them a frame of brood, please? So Greg, I always leave swarms for a couple of days prior to adding any feed. It encourages them to use what stores they're carrying with them and to head out foraging. It may also help reduce the risk of transmitting disease in any honey that they may have in their honey crops as they'll eat that first and not store it. In adding two drawn frames, you're potentially giving the queen room to lay eggs into immediately, but you could also find that should the bees be carrying any particular nasty spores in the honey that they're carrying, that could then get stored into those cells and create a problem for you in the future. Having said that, with all of the swarms that I've collected, I've yet to collect a swarm that has thrown up a major disease problem for me. Touch wood, uh, everything will continue in that vein. Uh, So I don't know that it will be a major risk for you, but it's always uh, worth mitigating any of those risks. So I would tend to only use foundation in any of the hives that I'm putting swarms into and allow them to draw those out for around 48 hours prior to adding any food. So on to the next question from Christopher Hindle and this also combines an additional question from Pam Melman. So Christopher says, Hello Stuart, do you have a method for encouraging bees to go up into and use supers before pressure on space forces them to do so? And is it an error to put on a super before the bees really need to use it? Pam then adds, Stuart, what is your view on adding a honey super and leaving it without a queen excluder for two to three days before adding that queen excluder to encourage workers to go up into it? Well, hi, Chris and Pam. Uh, Thanks for the questions. Timing with supers can be so tricky. As you point out, sometimes the bees seem to stubbornly refuse to go through the queen excluder and up into the super. It's usually a super with foundation in the frames rather than drawn comb, as I find they're happy to work on any drawn comb that I give them, and I don't recall ever seeing them refuse to go through a queen excluder onto frames that have got drawn comb on them. As Pam says, leaving the queen excluder out allows the queen to wander across all of those frames and generally speaking where she goes the workers will follow. A word of caution though, once they start to draw out the foundation she will quickly lay eggs in it. The cells don't even need to be fully drawn as the workers will build the comb around the developing larvae and then you'll have a 21 day wait until they emerge. I've used this method several times and uh, to be honest failed each and every time to prevent the queen from laying in cells in some of those frames but it does work it does encourage the queen through and into the super. So to answer your question Christopher um, remove the queen excluder and that will encourage bees generally to go up and into that super and use it. While we're on the subject of queen excluders, Jim King has sent in a question. Thanks, Jim. He says, Hi, Stuart. Regarding queen excluders, some books and videos state to lay the queen excluder so the wires run at 90 degrees to the frame, the same as you do. Others state it to lay so the wires run in the same direction as the frame. And my local association has beekeepers who, let's say, agree to disagree. Uh, don't they ever. I can't for the life of me figure out what the difference is as there should be exactly the same amount of space for the workers to get through. Do you have any advantages or disadvantages of one way or the other? Thanks, Jim. Well, Jim, the simple answer is that it really doesn't seem to matter which way round you place the excluder on the brood box and I suspect most people, like me, follow in the footsteps of whoever taught them. I place all of my excluders with the wires running across the frames And if I ever notice I'm placing it down with the wires running in line with the frames, I'll always change it. Uh, It's just because it feels wrong to me. I'm sure it's not, but it's just something that I've always done. Uh, It just triggers something in my head to say swap it around. So uh, the simple answer is I don't think it really matters which way round you put your queen excluder on. Uh, And of course, some people don't use queen excluders at all. So that uh, takes away the 
worry of which way round to have them. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. It's just one of those things. And I'm sure the beekeepers in your local association will continue to argue the difference between which way is the best. Question from Nita, Nita Patel. Hi, Nita. Uh, She says, hello, Stuart. What methods would you employ in order to stop a swarm from absconding? I'm going to assume that you're referring to a collected swarm that you've placed into a hive. If so, I don't use any mechanical methods of trying to prevent absconding. One thing I do make sure of is I use fresh foundation in the brood box and feed after 48 hours, as I mentioned in answering the earlier question. This is usually enough to keep them interested in the box for long enough and allows the queen to start laying eggs. And once she's laying eggs, you're pretty much in the clear and they will stay. Of course, not always. It doesn't always happen. But for most swarms, I think it's enough just to do that. Chris Palgrave says, Hello Stuart, if you want to split a colony but don't have queen cells or a supply of homegrown queens, please could you go through your approach to introducing a purchased or donated queen to a new nuke? Thanks. Hi Chris, for a hopelessly queenless colony, I usually hang the queen cage with the queen inside in the brood box and leave it for around 24 hours with the tag in place to prevent the workers from getting at her. Uh, I then go back in and check to see if they're balling the cage or just leaving it alone. If they're balling it, um, so that means uh, lots of bees surrounding and covering the cage. If they're balling it and actively trying to get at the queen, I'll leave it again for another 24 hours and just continue this routine until they've become completely uninterested in her. And then usually I just simply slide the cage cover back and run her onto a frame. If you watch her carefully... And the workers will do uh, one of several things. They'll either ignore her completely or they'll go over to her and groom and feed her. And that obviously shows that she's been accepted and all is fine. But if they start to attack and try to sting her, I'll pop her back into the cage and leave it again. And to be honest, I've never had a colony attack a queen after three or four days. So I think uh, it would probably be a case of just Keep going with that routine until she was accepted. Duncan Heather has posted a question saying, Hi Stuart, I have had two hives swarm on me in the last two weeks. The second happened today, only to return 10 to 15 minutes later. Is this a common occurrence and are they likely to try and swarm again in the next few days? And do you have any advice on what course of action you would recommend I do to the hive? Should I split or leave it with just a single queen cell? So hi Duncan, Uh, it's a fairly common occurrence and one I've seen with my own bees on several occasions and yes they will try to swarm again, I've watched my bees do just that. Where I have had this happen I've actually been able to go through the hive and find the queen. Uh, In this instance I caged the queen, moved the entire hive to another part of the apiary and set the old queen up in a new hive on the old stand position in the same way as you would for an artificial swarm. All the flying bees return to the queen on the old hive position as if they had swarmed. And then I always remove all except one queen cell in the original hive. My advice would be to split and remove all except one queen cell. Otherwise, I think they're pretty much bound to try and swarm again. Jonathan Walsh asks, I have a question about a nuke I'm waiting on being delivered. With the bad early spring weather, the nuke I was expecting in mid-May is now probably going to be late in June. As this is my first nuke, my question is, what is the latest you would expect to take delivery of a five-frame nuke and still have enough time to get the colony up and running and prepped for the winter? I'm not expecting to get a honey harvest this year, but wanted to check your thoughts on how this delay could impact the strength of the colony. Thanks, John. Hi John and thanks for the question. Uh, I'd be happy to take on a nuke in late summer. In fact I split a lot of my colonies after the summer flow for increase and the production of new queens. I continue feeding it until they've drawn out all of the brood frames and stored plenty of syrup for the winter. The new queens will also lay eggs longer into the autumn months than the older queens so you should get a nice strong colony established in plenty of time to overwinter them successfully. Ian Haslam writes, Hi Stuart, any comment on using drone foundation in super frames, increased cell size and more honey? 
Hi Ian, I've used Drone Foundation in Supers for exactly that reason and it works well. Of course, that is until the Queen slips through the Queen Excluder and up into the Super and lays up an entire box of Drone Foundation. Yep, it's happened to me on a couple of occasions now and it's really frustrating, but you could look at it as a positive and say that you're trapping Varroa mites. So yes, do use Drone Foundation in the supers for an increased amount of honey, but just be wary that if the queen gets through and starts laying eggs in there, you're going to have a 24-day wait before the drones emerge. But I would use it as a Varroa control mechanism and remove them, freeze them, and then probably feed them to the chickens. And finally, Duncan Heather asks, when adding new foundation, where in the hive is it best to place it to avoid the bees chewing holes in it? I have heard some people recommend the top of the hive where it's warmest. Others have suggested checkerboarding, and others have suggested above and some below the brood nest. Yours confused. Well, Duncan, yes, it is quite confusing. And to be honest, I don't really think it matters too much where you position the foundation. And let me just clarify that. Uh, I don't think the position matters a great deal at all. Rather that the bees are on a nectar flow or have sugar syrup being fed, you have plenty of bees and they're not being asked to draw too many frames in one go. I've tried a lot of different positions and it never really seems to matter where I put them. If they don't have the resources to build more comb, they will chew it down and use the wax instead of creating more of their own. So just to recap, a strong colony with plenty of bees with a good strong nectar flow on or feed them sugar syrup and you should find that they'll be fine. Well that's it for this week. Thanks for hanging around until the end of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed that and if you do have any further questions then please do send them over to me and I'll use them in next month's question and answers session. Next week we're going to continue our look at queen rearing but until then I'm Stuart Spinks. And that was beekeeping, short and sweet. Mm-hmm.